Julius Rosenwald is often quoted as saying, when he was a young man, that his goal for his life was to have an annual income of $15,000, $5,000 to live on, $5,000 to save, and $5,000 to give away. Whether or not he actually said this, he certainly, it certainly more than amply came true in his own life. Uh, he gave away some $63 million um, during the course of his lifetime and the life of the foundation that he created. Um, and is, is widely admired for his philanthropy. His philanthropy was rooted in two things. It was rooted in his Jewish heritage and his upbringing, and it was rooted in his own extremely practical personality and approach. By heritage and by nature, he was generous. By nature, he was also extremely practical. And these two strands are woven together in his philanthropy and in his life. And of course, it is to celebrate that philanthropy that well, we're all here celebrating the heritage of the Rosenwald schools. Um, we have a distinguished panel of members of the Rosenwald family who are going to talk to us about different aspects of Rosenwald's life and its impact. And we have two Rosenwald grandchildren, one great-grandson, and two cousins from the German side of the family. And I myself am what I call a Rosenwald wannabe. I married into the Rosenwald family. My husband, David, is a grandson of Julius Rosenwald's daughter, Adele. This is, one of, this is a picture of the family of Julius in the middle, uh, his son Lessing, his three daughters, Adele, Edith, and Marion, and his youngest son, William. So uh, our first speaker today is Peter Askely, who is a grandson of Julius Rosenwald. He is the son of Marion uh, Askely and her husband, Max. Uh, Peter is a historian with degrees from the University of Chicago, Oxford University, and the University of California at Berkeley. He has written the definitive biography of his grandfather, and um, I've been asked to remind you all that there is a book signing just after this session in the, in the concession stand, and Peter will be there selling, uh, signing copies of his book. As will you. As will I. Um, uh, Peter lives in Chicago, where he teaches fundraising at Spertus Institute of Jewish learning and leadership. And it's a pleasure to introduce Peter Askely. Thank you, Stephanie, and good morning. Uh, I share the joy of seeing so many familiar faces. Uh, I've been involved in this project for quite a while, and I really think these conferences are marvelous. What I'd like to do is in, a, in the 10 minutes that I'm allotted, uh, and Stephanie is going to be keeping very, very quick tabs, very good tabs on us all, is uh, to tell you just a few things that don't relate to Rosenwald schools, um, and then talk a little bit about his philanthropy and its influence on, on me. So one thing I do want to emphasize, this conference is all about how wonderful Julius Rosenwald was. But I, I want to make sure that you understand that this was a human being, that he had faults and flaws like other human beings, that he made mistakes, that he was extremely naive politically, uh, that he sometimes, uh, he could be influenced to do things that under other circumstances, I mean, for example, Stephanie talked about how practical he was. And yet, uh, he made one really bad business decision because, Booker T, because of Booker T. Washington, who urged him to invest in a cotton uh, or seed oil plant in Mound Bayou, Mississippi. The man who owned it was a swindler, but uh, Rosenwald went ahead and invested anyway and lost the money. This was not something that he would normally have done, but it just shows you that every once in a while you can, you can make a mistake. He, could, he had uh, times when he would rage, uh, he would fly into a rage, 
um, those times would pass, sort of like a thunderstorm, and then everything would be nice and calm again. But again, one has to take these into account. This was a man like other men, and, uh, and, and he, he did make mistakes. Um, he, he got involved in a very large range of his philanthropy spanned all kinds of things. Uh, initially, he, he began by giving mainly to Jewish causes, because the main, one of the major influences on him, as Stephanie has said, was his rabbi, Emil Hirsch, who was really progressive and who made, who, who urged the wealthy members of his congregation to give to social justice causes. And JR, as his friends called him, uh, really, really agreed with this and, and said that it was tremendously important to do this. And so he started out by giving money in the local Jewish community. Then he gradually extended it and ended up giving to money to uh, even to what was then called Palestine. So he gave money to the early money to the Technion in Palestine. And he was very uh, pleased to give money to an agronomist named Aaron Aronson, who had discovered a particular form of wheat which would grow in very arid climes. And he thought that this was terrific. And so he gave money to Aronson's agricultural experiment station near Haifa. So he, he, he gave money to these kinds of things. He uh, gave money to the museum. He started the idea of the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago because when he went to Munich with his children um, in 1911, uh, he his, his two older daughters were studying and finishing school in Germany, and he took the whole family over to Germany to visit them, and they were in Munich, and his two youngest children, my mother Marion and Elizabeth's father Bill, were extremely bored. And so he decided that he would devote one day to anything that each child wanted to do, and the only thing that William wanted to do was to go to this museum that had recently opened in Munich called the Deutsches Museum and it was a sort of prototype of the Museum of Science and Industry and so every single time it was William's turn to choose he wanted to go there so JR got a lot of experience going to the Deutsches Museum and decided that something like this ought to be built in Chicago it took a while, though, because he had other things to do, like being president of Sears. And it wasn't until he retired in 1924 that he had the opportunity to really push this idea. But he managed to do so. He managed to uh, get the idea through the Civic Club of Chicago. And he ended up putting more money into it. He really was the only force that got it off the ground. If it hadn't been for him, the Museum of Science and Industry would never have been built. Now it's one of the most successful museums in Chicago. Um, so this is sort of one of the ways that he, he approached things. Uh, we all know how the Rosenwald Schools got started. It was through two books that he read in 19, that were sent to him in 1910, uh, one of which was Booker T. Washington's autobiography. Uh, and, and the other was the biography of uh, a railroad, Southern Railroad magnate, and that was the one that really impressed him, and he wrote to his two daughters in, in Germany and said that he, he really admired this man, and he wanted to be like him, he wanted to emulate him, but that that man had got a college degree, and Rosenwald never had. He, he, left, he left school after his sophomore year, and this was something that bothered him all of his life. Uh, he refused to accept an honorary degree from any educational institution because he himself had not earned even a bachelor's degree. Um, there were lots of other things that he got involved in. He got involved in supporting co Russian Jewish colonies in the Crimea and Ukraine. He, he pledged them 
$5 million. That was a lot of money in those days. And the reason, again, was an agronomist. And again, it was the idea of self-help, which, which was so important in terms of the Rosenwald schools, because this agronomist uh, had told him that, uh, had shown him that after the Russian Revolution, when Jews could accept, could do anything they wanted to, that one thing that they could do was to learn about agriculture, which they hadn't been allowed to do under the czars. And so to put them in these kind of agricultural colonies that were prototypes of the kibbutz and giving them the opportunity to, to farm, it turned out that they were very successful farmers. And so he thought this was an absolutely marvelous project because it would mean that Russian Jews wouldn't have to go to Palestine. They could, see, he was not a Zionist. He was sort of a, he claimed he was a non-Zionist rather than an anti-Zionist. But they could stay in Russia where they knew the language, farm, and be successful. And so he thought this was one of the reasons why he thought that this project was so marvelous. So these are some examples of other things that he did besides just giving money to, to the schools, although that he always claimed that the schools was one of the most successful things that he did. I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk about his, his philanthropy. Peter, too. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. Um, one of the most important things that he did as a philanthropist was to end the Rosenwald Fund. This was groundbreaking. It had never been done before. And he insisted that it end within 25 years of his death. It ended earlier because of the Depression. But one of the reasons that he did this was his belief that each generation should spend its own money on the causes that it believed in. And so each one of his children established their own foundation and spent them out of it. They also got spent out of existence. And now it's down to the third and fourth generations. And I, too, have been influenced by the kinds of things that JR was involved in, so that uh, I mean, I too am interested in, in, in African, in, in things like diversity in terms of education. So that one of the things that I support is a project at the University of Chicago to increase the diversity of the of the student body and give them support. So that uh, students of color aren't going to come in, get no help, and then drop out early because because they can't can't be assisted. Um, and I'm also interested in, uh, in arts education and diversity there also in the city of Chicago. So I, I remain committed to some of the ideas that JR uh, propounded. And I think that other members of the family probably are too. But I'm going to stop now before Stephanie cuts me off. And I hope you all have questions, and I'd be happy to answer them later. Thank you. We'll save time for. Thank you, Peter. We'll save time for all the questions at the end. But I'm glad you mentioned the Russian colonies. That's a wonderful story that some scholar needs to needs to address. It's just a great story that that I talked. Yeah, talked. You're going to mention that? No, no. People have written about it. But um, I talked a lot with your dad about it. Um, okay, Elizabeth Barrett. She is one of the three daughters of Julius Rosenwald's youngest son, uh, youngest child, William. Uh, and she grew up in New York City uh, and is a director of American Securities Management and uh, a vice president of the William Rosenwald Family Fund. Elizabeth. Hi. I'm really glad to be here. And I think I'd rather sit and listen to your stories, because I know my own stories. <laughs> but right now, I'm supposed to tell you my stories. And uh, just looking at all the people here, and the people who didn't have to be here, you could have stayed home, watched TV, or whatever you like to do, hang out with your grandchildren or children, or whatever, whatever you like to do, and you came here. And it's fascinating to me that you took the trouble to do that, that you were so motivated. And I, I would love to know what motivated you. And I guess that's one of my biggest questions in life, that and how do you get through the day? 
really. I, that sounds awful, but I really mean that. Uh, of course, when I was young, I thought being pretty would make me, you know, really popular. Forget that. And then I thought, well, in high school, being smart was really going to be the thing. And then when I was in college, I got really depressed, and I thought, well, if you just get through the day, that's really good. And then the rest is extra. So I really wonder about people how how people get through the day, which brings us to. Uh, America in 1862, right after the Civil War. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that while well, Peter was talking, I was thinking how much has changed and how much hasn't changed. And uh, that's a question, not a statement. But I couldn't help think that. I also think that it's very interesting that blacks and Jews, or African Americans and Jews, should come together on a project. and. How do you define yourself? Do you define yourself as a woman or a man? Do you define yourself as American, an Afro-American, a Jew? H how do you define yourself? What about redheads? What about people with brown eyes? I mean, I don't understand it, but we all like to define ourselves in certain ways. And I think with Judaism, it has to do with, in particular for me, values. Uh, Samuel Rosenwald, his father had died. His mother was running a small store in Bunde, in uh, northwestern Germany. 18 1862, it was shortly after a whole bunch of revolutions in Europe which had left the place a mess, and Germany included. And he came to America uh, and uh, became a peddler. And he said the best day in his life was the day he got a horse, because then he didn't have to carry the pack anymore. And uh, he ended up in, he landed in Baltimore and did the Winchester Trail, which you may know, I don't, but you know there's a book written about it now by Hasia Diner. And, um, Many Jews did that, many non-Jews did it. it, meant going door to door with, with whatever, uh, cloth or thimbles or whatever. And um, then he ended up working for the Hammerslaw daughters, Hammerslaw brothers, who had recently come also from Germany, and marrying their um, sister. And uh, that was, that became those two people, Augusta, and Samuel became Julius Rosenwald's parents. That's to say, they gave birth to him. And they gave birth to uh, actually six other children, but one didn't survive. Uh, but, and um, Julius actually uh, grew up catty corner from Lincoln, who had died, and uh, who had been shot and died, and, and, and remember selling commemorative uh, pamphlets as a kid, so he already was <coughs> in the merchandising industry. And um, <coughs> he grew up with a fairly successful family, moved to New York. He, he didn't graduate, as a, he didn't leave school as a sophomore in college. He left so school as a sophomore in high school, 16 years old. That was it. My mother never went to school, so and she's the smartest person I ever met. So. We're all talking about schools, and I think schools can be life-saving, but you can also be an intellectual without them, too. It depends on your culture, and I think the finest thing that I have seen in the Rosenwald schools I've visited and heard from the people who went was the culture. They learned a lot, but they learned pride. They learned to love learning. They learned to feel like a great group. And, um, but by the time Julius had made all his money in Sears, he and his wife were very swept away by the incredible success, business success of Sears. And they had social and philanthropic and business responsibilities. And my father thought that the poem by Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, Children's Hour, was the one hour a day you could see your mother. He thought that's the meaning of it. And he would just wait to see his mother and was brought up with Peter's mother, they were the babies, as twin almost, uh, really by Miss Nickerson, the governess. And I think my father grew up feeling very lonely, except for Peter's mother, very, very lonely. He wasn't sociable. I myself wasn't very sociable when I was a kid. I think it runs in the family. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> and um, he, my father, remembers, for example, being jealous of the chauffeur's children. That sounds like a joke, right? But because that he saw the children in the kitchen with their mother often, and he thought that was such a wonderful thing. So I think, what does that mean? That means that somehow Julius knew what suffering was. 
And William, my father, knew what suffering was. And I think if you don't have any sense of what suffering is, maybe you just don't understand that people need to be helped. But I would say I define what I want for my children and for myself is to be able to have a life that is aware of other people, aware of reaching out to other people and being able to accept when they reach out to me a life of love and about caring and respect for other people and that's what Julius embodied. So uh, he had no pretensions at all. He was totally unpretentious and was able to create an atmosphere at Sears where he wasn't just the big boss. He would go actually to Europe for what, two months? Every many summers, is that right, Peter? And, and somehow the store ran very well by itself. He was able to give other people the sense of responsibility that um, people don't have these days. Uh, but my father took this feeling of needing to help other people and he transferred it at the time he was very aware because they were always going to Germany of what was going on at the beginning of World War II. And it was said that uh, he loved, he, so he spent all his time trying to rescue people from Germany because he saw that they had very little time before they were going to get slaughtered. I don't know how he saw it when other people didn't, but, but he did. And he and his whole family, but he and his sister Marion in particular worked, they hired social workers and so forth and lawyers, and they got out many, many of the relatives. And my father told a terrible story, which I told our cousin recently, what's the difference between a second cousin and a second cousin once removed? Right? Do you all know? I do, but because he told me, but life and death. Because where did they cut off the reaching out to the family? And that's a scary story to me, but anyway, uh, he understood that people said that he loved refugees so much he married one. That was my mother. She, she was a refugee from Russia and then also from Berlin. And, and uh, she called herself a refugee, but that was very good. She also, she also referred to us as Jew rich kids, which I think was accurate. <laughs> and I will tell you just, just for, for my own sake, and this is the last thing I have to say, is that when I thought of my children, I thought, how will I transfer to them that sense of obligation that my mother and my father gave to me and that you obviously have, and I thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Jew rich kids. I'm going to remember that. David Stern's grandmother was Julius Rosenwald's middle child, Edith, uh, and his grandfather was her husband, Edgar Stern, the first Jew to trade on the Cotton Exchange in New Orleans. And Edith and Edgar Stern were major civic leaders uh, in New Orleans. David uh, lives in Washington, D.C. He went to Georgetown Law School there, and he is the executive director of Equal Justice Works, an $18 million nonprofit that is committed to creating a just society by mobilizing the next generation of lawyers to work on behalf of underserved communities. And so it's wonderful to have David Stern here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Stephanie. So um, I'm going to talk about what it's like being the fourth generation. You know, there's <laughs> JR, who you've now heard, Julius Rosenwald, that was kind of how we referred to him in our, um, in our family and then what happens with his legacy and how it transmitted a lot of values and, um, and commitments. And you've already heard a little bit about this. So um, the first thing is, I, when I was growing up, I didn't know anything about Julius Rosenwald. Um, we didn't really talk about it. We just knew that there was a lot of wealth. It came from the guy who built Sears to what it is. And we all kind of grew up knowing a little bit about him, but really not that much. And most of the stories were apocryphal. In fact, um, one of the things that I've learned in the last few years is how many of those stories were probably not true, you know. But nevertheless, these were the kind of the things that we, uh, we learned about kind of on our parents' knees. So as Stephanie mentioned, so there's JR, then the daughter Edith. She was in her own right a kind of civil rights activist in New Orleans. She would drive down um, and register African Americans to vote. 
She was very involved with Dillard University, again, in the same way that Julius Rosenwald spent a lot of money on Tuskegee. Um, he, she spent a lot of her money um, on creating um, and supporting Dillard University and, uh, and really instilled those values also in my father, uh, Philip Stern, who came to Washington, D.C., did public policy advocacy, and really taught, and again, this is the tradition of our family, taught philanthropy, really taught all of us kids kind of on their on my parents' knees about giving money away. So I want to um, talk a little bit about that because each one of these foundations, Peter already mentioned it, they lived for a 25-year period. Every foundation from JR and then Edith created a foundation called the Stern Fund, and that was one which was Edith, her kids, and then the, the, the grandkids who were on there. So that was actually my first exposure. We'd have these foundation meetings. Uh, and really, as young as I can remember, 10 years old, maybe even younger, I would go to these meetings, I'd sit in the corner, and it was an unusual foundation because we'd have grantees actually come in and make presentations about their project. And it's related to this principle, and I think when you see Aviva's movie on Friday, you'll have a chance to see this, this idea of betting on people. A lot of folks can submit really good proposals, but then you meet them and you realize they're not quite, they don't have what it takes in order to make them successful. So these meetings, you know, we would grade the proposals based on what was written, and then you'd meet the people, and many times your opinions change based on, um, based on meeting them. Sometimes they'd write a really crappy proposal, but they'd come in and you'd say, that person has the mettle and the determination and passion in order to make that project a success. So it was very interesting to see how the decisions changed and that you can't really judge merit uh, based on written proposals alone. <clears throat> so again, I'm sitting in the corner, I'm listening to these phenomenal activists. We had very little religious training in our family. Actually, I would say our religion was social justice. We talked a lot about it at the dining room table. It was kind of the kind of core values that we grew up with. So a lot of the people who presented were really on the front lines working for social justice and doing very avant-garde work. So you can imagine philanthropy is actually not something you intuitively know how to do, but watching people who know how to do it well is extraordinary. It was probably the greatest life lesson of my upbringing was watching people who ask great questions. How is this project sustainable? Is it replicable? What about leveraging dollars, matchmaking, you know, the match, matching grants, which again, I'll just touch on just for a second. But just having the benefit of seeing wise people who had done this for a whole generation and listening to the way they thought about how to leverage and how to make the greatest impact with a relatively small amount of money um, was really quite an extraordinary lesson. So uh, I mentioned the power of betting on hot people. And that really has been not only the story of that foundation, but also the story of my life, my career. I've worked at this nonprofit organization that really is supporting the next generation of public interest lawyers, and it's all about betting on hot people. You know, people who are really talented with vision and passion and putting them in communities that are underserved that need that kind of legal talent. And again, it's just been a phenomenal experience in my, in my life. So I want to talk for a minute about one of the things that's unusual about this foundation, which was our family foundation. So again, it was my grandmother had the Stern Fund, then my father had the Stern Family Fund, and that really was the end of any institutional foundations because all the money got spent out after 25 years. <laughs> Individually, our family continues to be philanthropists, we still give money away, but it's less institutional than it was with those different foundations. But this whole idea of spending, spending it down, not uh, leaving any money at the end of the day, is one of the principles that JR believed in and we've all inherited it. Believe it or not, the trend is now, it was 5% 50 years ago of foundations that uh, would spend down, and now it's around 24%. So it's gone up dramatically, and more and more people are asking about this. So JR actually wrote an article in the Atlantic Monthly where he talked a little bit about why do I do this? Why do I feel so strongly? And basically his view was foundations that are perpetual are evil. They're not very good because they, as much as they try to anticipate the problems in the future, they really don't know what's going to happen. And so many times um, the dead hand rules, conditions that may have existed when that person was alive, when they created the foundation, 
those conditions change over time. So a couple things. One was let's create these foundations that are limited in duration. There will be future generations of wealth that will give money away. Also, we don't want to spend a lot of money on overhead. Let's spend the money now. Let's make a difference. Can you imagine if Julius Rosenwald decided to do one school at a time versus doing what he did? I mean, that is, to me, bold, risky, and brilliant. And that's the kind of philanthropy that I think my family was also kind of brought up with, which was take risks, be more generous than not. You know, there are people who are hoarders, and then there are people who are saying more with the spirit of generosity. And I think our family was always, my father always said, err on the side of generosity. When in doubt, give the money away. So um, that has been a, a great lesson. The other thing is, um, yeah, I mentioned the overhead. The final thing I want to mention is just, and this is again part of the reason why I love the 25 year story and giving money while you're alive and not leaving it for somebody else to give away, is the joy of giving. You know, I always feel like the satisfaction that I know I have experienced in my life um, supporting organizations that I so passionately believe in is incredibly joyful. It's a pump your fist enthusiasm that you get when you make a grant and you're, and you're enabling something to happen that didn't happen before. And you know, the idea that you don't experience that in life and leave the money to somebody else to have that experience, it's like, why would you do that? <laughs> you know? Just strikes me as so intuitive. Do it while you're alive and have fun doing it. Finally, the last thing I'm gonna mention is matching grants, um, because this again is a tradition that got passed down and then I'm finished. Uh, so matching grants, um, my, my father inherited this honestly, as you know, Julius Rosenwald, famous, and I really do want to say something that Alice Rosenwald mentioned in one of our meetings, which is the real power, look, 20% of every dollar is what made these schools, 20 cents on the dollar. I mean, most of the money came from the community. This guy gets a lot of credit for being the spark that made it happen, but the truth is the communities owned and invested those, owned and really were investors in those schools, and that's what made them so successful. So the power of matching money is extraordinary, and my dad, oh my God, these nonprofit executives who I meet now and then, they say, you can't imagine how cockamamie his, his matching grant, grants would be. So if you raise more money from your board than last year with, you know, so they have to renew what they gave plus a thousand dollars, then I'll match it up to five thousand dollars. I mean, again, these crazy conditions that, in the end, made it very difficult. But it also was to try to make a marginal difference. You know, how can I incentivize people to make that extra effort that they might not do? So um, that's my little story in a nutshell. Again, I feel very honored to be with all of you, and again with my relatives. I learn every time I'm with everybody. I always feel like I'm learning so much more about my great grandfather that I did not know at all growing up. But thanks again. Thank you, David. Okay, we're going to move over to the German side of the family. Robert Rosenwald was born in Chicago, actually in Michael Reese Hospital, which was one of the first um, institutions that Julius Rosenwald gave money to when he was uh, newly wealthy. Uh, but he grew up in South Dakota. Before retiring, he was a senior executive with the National Security Agency, and he also spent a year on the Joint Congressional Intelligence Committee investigating the performance of the intelligence community after the 9-11 attacks. Um, Bob and his wife, Jean, now live in Savannah, Georgia, and I am going to leave it to his presentation to tell you exactly how he fits into the Rosenwald family. Uh, we put this together. Jean, my wife, will uh, correct me where I have uh, leave a few things out or uh, miss a beat. So don't be bashful, Jean. Oh, um, I'm anyway, that's, that's, that's Julius, and uh, I'm here to talk about a specific issue very personal to me, the reason I'm here. Uh, so this all relates to the, really the money and the philosophy of Julius Rosenwald. He's the linchpin in what I'm about to say. Um, so from, uh, don't forget, because I won't mention him again for a little while, but he is the guy that made all this happen. So I'm here to talk about a specific issue, that is how my father, Fritz, 
and then anglicized to Fred, got over here thanks to the generosity of the Rosenwald family and some of, some of the stuff you've heard here about the, uh, the funds and so on and the influence that important people have. There I am, the little guy on the, 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 little guy on the right. I was bald then and I'm bald now. <laughs> and that's my proud father. So how do we fit in? There's Bendix on your left and Julius on the right. And their fathers, Bendix's father was Hermann, Julius's father was Samuel, they were brothers. So that's my father's father, my grandfather, and we have huge generations in my family. He was born, Bendix was born in 1861 in Germany, and uh, Julius, of course, was born in 1862 in Springfield. And that's my grandfather. So I am as old as I think I am. <laughs> this picture, which is one of two I've got here, demonstrates uh, that uh, Julius and family would come over and visit the German family frequently. His wife, kids, and here, and there's a lesson. That's my grandma, that's, that's Julius's, or that's uh, Bendix's wife, and I'm almost certain that's Bendix. And then this is another visit. This was in Berlin, and there's the family. And this was on the back of this picture, uh, which uh, obviously uh, 1924. And uh, by that time, Bendix was already dead. And you can see how much Emma has aged. This is her. Your grandmother. My, gran my grandmother. Your Thank father. you, Jean. Father. Yeah, my father. Is this studious guy right there? <laughs> what made this all? What made this? What I'm about to say is my interpretation of materials that we were given by Bob Adler. Bob Adler is uh, the son of Max and Sophie Adler, and I'll, I'll get to all that. Sophie Adler was a <laughs> sister of Julius. Oh, Gussie. No, oh, no, Julius. Yeah. <laughs> She's supposed to help me, not you. <laughs> so I've mentioned some of the players already. Uh, Emma, my father's mother, my grandmother. Sophie and Max Adler, Bob Adler, and then William and Lessing Rosenwald, and you've heard about them already. So I've got some pictures. Everybody said when you set up a PowerPoint slide, have pictures, so here are my pictures. That's another shot of Emma, my grandmother. Isn't that a great one? Yes. I, I, anybody who has better pictures, because there are some, because I had to scrounge around to find one of Bob, and I also had to scrounge a little bit for William, but that's Lessing. He, had, he took some great shots. When he said jump, I'd say how high, I think. Anyway, here's, here's the deal. This was the situation that would, that and this is my interpretation of the situation as it presented itself. 1933, the Nazis come to power in Germany, and my parents, uh, my, my parents, my family had a cigar manufacturing facility in Bunda, Germany. That particular area of Germany was well known for uh, tobacco manufacturing, cigar manufacturing, and they had a small operation. And uh, in 1933, it was seized. Uh, and my father had, you know, was lamenting that the Nazi flag flying over their cigar factory. Emma, who was the CEO by then, and she was 60 some years old, so all of a sudden she had no job. My father, who was going to be the CEO, he was the only man in the house. He had three sisters. Uh, all of a sudden he was out of work with no prospects. And of course over here, Big time depression. So in 1933, my grandmother, seeing the handwriting on the wall, wrote a letter to, to uh, Max and Sophie Adler, who she was, seemed to be closest to them, saying she was looking for their help to get Fritz, son Fritz, over to the United States. And I, you'll see at the top of these things I have, I kind of, these are my interpretation of kind of how things went. 
the Adlers responded with a re sympathetic but very realistic letter that said, if times are tough over here, we'll do our best, but we're not absolutely certain you know, how fast we can go on this because jobs are hard to find for anybody. So there was a good, obviously a break in correspondence till 1934. Uh, was there some missing? I don't know, but it looks like it's pretty seamless, so I don't think there was any correspondence between the, between the letters that I mentioned up there. But letters were then written, and this was the optimistic period. They were making, at, they were, the United States in that time were, was, and I'll get to this in a little bit more detail, uh, immigration was tough because of the, because of the uh, uh, depression. And of course, it, frankly, the United States was not welcoming to Jewish immigrants in those days. So it made it real hard. And there had to be a minimum of $3,000 annual compensation or a guarantee of same for, to, ha to accept any immigrant that would come over. During that period, the Rosenwald Family Fund, one of them, was beginning to pay Emma, who is now out of a job, 200 Reichsmarks a month. My father, who had not yet assumed any uh, job of importance, was not getting anything as far as we know. And Max Adler was very confident that they were sending the proper affidavits and everything would be swell and he would be getting on the boat shortly. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, my father w went to the uh, American consulate. Uh, he actually was very optimistic after receiving all this information. Uh, even book passage. Uh, then his application was denied, and I'll get to the, the details here. Some very plaintive letters were written uh, about uh, the denial and the reasons for the denial. Uh, and uh, this was, and you can't see these things, I thought we'd probably see better, but this is a letter from the American consulate in, in uh, Stuttgart to Max Adler, saying Fritz was unemployed. He talks about having 2,000 Reichsmarks but couldn't prove it. Uh, he presented an affidavit executed by Sophie Adler, which says that she had income in excess of $3,000, but no reference to the sources. So any excuse to not honor these, the commitment that the United States, at least the consulate here, was looking for. I, my father was also, in his words, had a five-minute medical exam. They found him nearsighted. Can you believe it? <laughs> um, and uh, they didn't find him bald, but uh, they, found, they found him nearsighted, and they also said he had a heart defect. He was, in fact, nearsighted, but it was correctable. As a matter of fact, they even said it was correctable, and he had no heart defect. So then the, uh, the system got restarted. The, the Rosenwalds and the Adlers doubled down. They involved some high-powered lawyers who knew much more about how the immigration system worked and how the world of Washington politics and bureaucracy worked. And even so, it took months and months to get the proper paperwork, as you might expect. Uh, people of wealth are not necessarily interested in providing all the information about their wealth, so they want to provide minimum necessary to get the job done, but that's it. There was an amazing letter that was in this collection by someone who I am not familiar with. I'd be interested if anybody in, uh, in the Rosenwald family and they, uh, would, would know this. There's a, this L. Fable, who is a PhD, sent a letter to William Rosenwald. And, and, and this guy was from Bunda, and he got a fellowship to get out of, he, and he was not Jewish. He got a fellowship to go to China to teach. And he described, and I'm going to quote some things there, he described in vivid detail for William Rosenwald. And William carbon copied this and sent it to a whole host of Rosenwalds. You can read these for yourself. But, and, read them. It's a little... Is it fuzzy? Yeah. 
When I left Germany, fall of 1934, the situation of our Jewish friends was absolutely unbearable. The persecution of the Jews by the Nazis made their life hopeless. My friend Fritz Rosenwald to be treated like a criminal, to be a second-class man, excluded from society like a dog. Conditions in Germany grew worse and worse so that this man of originally good humor lost all hope for his personal future. <coughs> I point to the fact that Mr. Fritz Rosenwald does not know anything of this letter because he is too modest to ask for further help. Besides, it is impossible to write further details about his personal conditions from Germany, as you might expect since, the, since these letters were uh, censored. So that, that letter helped really to get to the finish line. Uh, he, they got Senator Van Nuys from, of the Foreign Affairs Committee involved, sending letters to the State Department. Ro Bob Adler stepped up and put a remarkable amount of personal financial information on paper, as in, in the form of, of an affidavit, as did Sophie Adler. Um, and that, apparently, a, a letter and this new information got the Stuttgart consulate to relook at it. November 8th, my dad was called to the uh, council, and this is the radiogram that he sent on November 9th, sailing December 3rd, SS Washington, news thankfully accepted Fritz. And why did this take so long? I've already alluded to the U.S. immigration policy. Uh, the expectation of the Rosenwald family, like any family of influence, expects when they say something, something will actually happen. And they said something, and nothing happened. Um, it was sort of breathtaking to them um, that, that they, they, had, they had kind of said this should happen, and it didn't. So that was kind of an eye-opener to them. The conditions, of course, in Germany were unbelievably intolerable, so intolerable that the people here, frankly, did not know how bad they were. And of course, the usual bureaucratic inertia. I'll finish up by saying that when, when Fred got here, he changed his name to Fred, um, he absolutely laid it out in crystal clear detail how bad it was over there. And the Rosenwald Family Fund geared up uh, and used personal guarantees and whatever was necessary to bring the rest of his family over. Emma got over, the three sisters got over, one of Emma's sisters got over, lots of other people got over. Helen Stahl here in the front row got over. So the Rosenwald Fund, and don't forget, it all goes back to Julius, the Rosenwald Funds and the money that he was able to make and then distribute enabled all this to happen. So as Bob Adler told us when we saw him in 1980, the last, the last time we saw him, they were bringing people over they didn't even know. It was because, uh, so I, I like to thank my father who fought a tough, two-plus year battle to get over, uh, relying, of course, on the Rosenwalds who did come through, um, really made a difference when he did get here. But it all goes back to him. Um, and so that's my personal story, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, I'll leave that up if you don't mind. Like. Yeah, I think so. Well, it, it looks like a picture of you. Yeah. Um, it is me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the strong genes in the Rosenwald family. Um, Helen Rosenwald Stahl was born in Bunda, and she spent her early years in her grandfather's house there, where Julius Rosenwald often visited and where that picture may have been taken. Uh, she came to the United States as a seven-year-old girl. Uh, and she has lived much of her life here in Durham, where she is an honorary board member of the Russell Rosenwald School. Well, my, my story has been preempted by, by many of the people who spoke before me. And 
I'm going to tell you about how the Rosenwald Fund saved our family, like Bob's family, in 1930, this was in 1936. And we lived in Bunde, in the little town that Julius visited annually. And it was most, very often to my grandfather's house where we lived, where Julius visited as well, bearing wonderful gifts. <laughs> In this, in this was in the West Bunde is in a Westphalian town quite near Holland. And my grandfather and his brother Julius had inherited a cigar factory. But I don't know the one that uh, Bob was talking about. There may have been two. Two. They, yeah. two because no Nazi flag ever flew over our, <laughs> over my grandfather and his brother's uh, factory. We lived within walking distance of the factory. And my parents and grandfather <coughs> were very respected and active people in Bunde. And it was a small town. The town apparently was small enough so that they did not take, the powers that be did not take the anti-Jewish laws as seriously as other parts of Germany. Life in the small town was business as usual till about 1935 when the Nuremberg laws, which were passed in 1933, finally caught up with us all. My dad, who was always active in the community, was asked to resign from the volunteer fire department and to drop out of the Gesangverein. And in Germany, <clears throat> these glee clubs were a very important part of the social life in Germany, in the town. He, he was their star tenor, and by the way, he never sang again after we left Germany. I was turning six and due to begin first grade in April, but that was not possible. I would have had to go to a Jewish school a few miles away from Bunde and away from all my friends. It was time to leave Germany, but how? And a cousin named Paul who lived, and I, can't find him on a family tree anywhere. But he lived in Berlin, and he went to New York to, the William, to William Rosenwald and asked for help in securing affidavits for our families to emigrate to America. An affidavit is an agreement with the government to accept legal responsibility to, re to support a family member until he or she becomes a citizen. What I had heard, it was $1,000 in those years. Bob said it was 3000 But anyway, so well, let's compromise on two. <laughs> and for the amount of a family, on my closed circuit part, it was 60 people. So multiply that. Um, anyway. He went to the offices of the Rosenwald Family Association to meet with William Rosenwald, the fund's administrator and the youngest son of Julius Rosenwald. Well, we did get the affidavit, and we came over, lived in New York. Well, we came over on a boat, the SS Roosevelt, which was Teddy not FDR. <laughs> and not only did my immediate family come over, but even some in-laws, my mother's brother, came over. And it, it was just a marvelous thing. We, we got off the boat, and 
we had to, there was an immigration officer at the end of the gangplank, and he would say, oh, who is your sponsor? We'd say, William Rosenwald. Next one came, William Rosenwald. Next one came, William Rosenwald. And finally, the guy said, does he know you're coming? <laughs> Well, not only, not only did he know that we were coming, but he had arranged for a social worker to meet us, to take us to a hotel, to be a support and like a concierge for the family that came at that time. And sent the kids to camp. We, it was just, a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And once a year, after we were all settled, he would come to visit. And that was quite a visit. I mean, my mother would be hysterical for a week before he came. <laughs> but, and when, oh, and when we arrived to uh, the apartments that the Rosenwald Fund had, William had set up for us, each one of us received, and I can still see it in front of me, a silver tone radio, one of these ones that looked like a little chapel with a green eye when you turned it on. And we, we were really so grateful. The most my memories of Germany were, I, I don't have many, because my father was a photographer and took so many pictures, I have no idea what's, what was really the reality and what I remember. But my uh, oldest cousin, Herb, who was about 11 years old when we came over, <coughs> was really the most affected by what had happened in Germany. He got beat up regularly and vilified and so forth. And when he came home from school after that first week, he came and he said, you won't believe what happened. David Cohn carried the flag at the assembly. David Cohn was obviously a Jewish kid and he had had the biggest honor of, fly, of holding the flag. Now, my connection with the Rosenwald School here came about in a very odd way. Knew nothing about Rosenwald schools because they just weren't, we, we were not aware of them. And with the modesty of the Rosenwald family, there, there not much was, nothing was made of it, especially in New York. And we, my husband and I were visiting friends in Greensboro one day. And they gave us, instead of going on the highway, they told us a shortcut through Greensboro, from Greensboro to Durham. And we stopped at a traffic light in Burlington. And we're waiting, at the red light, of course. And Look at the name of that street. And it was Rosenwald Street. So naturally made a left turn. And there was a little store on the corner. And then the next building was a funeral home. And there were two gentlemen sitting on the porch. And I went up and I told them, I asked how come this is Rosenwald Street, and I told them that was my maiden name. I was from the Rosenwald family. And they said, well, there used to be a Rosenwald school here. There is now a social service place, center here. But this used to be a Rosenwald school. And so that's, that was my introduction to the Rosenwald schools, and not too long after that, there was a little article in the Durham paper, and the Durham paper always has these little snippets of what's going on. 
and there was a thing, and you know how when you see something familiar, it kind of jumps out at you? And there was Rosenwald. It's a Cain's Chapel is having a Rosenwald School uh, picnic or fundraiser or something, and there was somebody's name attached. So I, Durham being Durham in those days, I picked up the phone and got the telephone number. And I called this lady, Mrs. Mack, and lo and behold, she told me there was she was active with this Russell Rosenwald School, and of course we met, and they put me on the board, not knowing that I was not the big branch, right. but just, just a little twig. <laughs> anyway, it's been a wonderful relationship, and I'm very pleased to be here. That was so great to hear from, hear from uh, Helen and Bob about the German family. I bet you all have questions. Um, please, that's, that's uh, what we're here for, to have a conversation. Anyone? David? I'll, I'll start off. I, one of the things that I'm amazed when I read Peter's book and also just hearing the story of Julius Rosemont going to Germany every year while he's running this company, it's not like you could fly over there. You're taking a boat. How the heck did he do it? Yeah. Yeah, do you want to tell us? <laughs> well, I mean, he, he took off. You know, not, I don't think it was every summer, but he went over there very frequently, and often it was to see, he had a mission, really, which was to see the family. And in the 20s, when Germany was suffering from really severe depression, uh, and, and uh, you know, hyperinflation and so forth, then he really had to go and take over um, things, and he gave m money to the family, and he would visit various areas. He vi would visit Bunda, he would go to Hamburg, and there was a Paul who actually had come over here and briefly had a job at Sears, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so he, uh, he also went to, uh, to Berlin, and in other places, it was there that he, uh, he, he got various, he would get ideas from, like just as he got the idea for the Museum of Science and Industry, so in Berlin he saw a housing development which was being built for indigent people and he got the idea of building something similar in Chicago and the result is the Michigan Boulevard Garden Apartments which was the first housing complex built for African Americans in the city of Chicago a place which is now being revivified. I might just add um, that uh, Sears had a presence in Berlin and London, so he had, uh, he had good business reasons to go to check up on that as well. But, uh, and that picture was taken in London. Yeah, that, 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 one, that one of the two pictures that I showed up there was in fact taken at the Adlon Hotel in Berlin. So you mean there was a Sears store in, in um, there was Berlin? A, there was a, uh, uh, yeah. Supply, yeah. It, it's, I don't know if it was a retail, but there was a there was a presence with a with uh, individuals from America posted there. Wow. Both in London and Berlin. Gosh, I didn't know that. So I'm I've always been fascinated by the form and function aspect of the school design and wondered if there, you know, he, he took advantage of influencers. <coughs> Abraham Flexner for curricula and um, so I wonder about Bauhaus, which is a real big form follows function uh, design location in Germany. You know, if, if there was any understanding that that might have had some influence on his schools because his schools seem to reflect that concept so much. Wow, that's a really interesting question, and I can honestly say I have no idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand that to Peter. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, the schools actually were designed by a man named uh, Taylor, who was the architect at Tuskegee. And he was the one who, Robert, was, w. Robert w. Taylor, his son Robert Taylor, 
actually became the superintendent of the Michigan Boulevard Garden Apartments. But Robert W. Taylor was designed these plans which became standard so that once the schools were in the hands of the Rosenwald Fund, which happened in about 1920, if I'm not mistaken, they really had to be built to a certain uh, standard. There were various possibilities that you could use depending on the number of teachers, but it had absolutely nothing to do with the Bauhaus. <laughs> Yes. Oh, sorry. One of the things that I have learned, oh, am I? Well, one of the things that I have learned about. I don't know what that is. See if that works. One of the things that I've learned about schools is that they were either north facing or south facing. And that was to take advantage of the light. Although they were electrified. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. No, no, they weren't. Yeah. no. no right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Not in the beginning. But the, by being facing either north or south, depending on where the trees were, that was the good lighting. I'd like to add one postscript. Bob said I can jump in, so I'm jumping in. <laughs> this is Jean, Bob. Yes. Was. <laughs> the end of the story about Fritz coming to Chicago and creating a life, he told me this story. And when we started going through the documents, it's all there, all backed up. He waited the five years, and he was ready to become a citizen. And he marched himself off to the office he was sworn in in Chicago as a citizen of the United States. And at that moment, the man who had just sworn him in and congratulated him was handed a telegram. And the man said, you're a very lucky man. This was the morning of Monday, December 8, 1941. He said, you are the last person to become a U.S. citizen, we are shutting the office down. Oh. <laughs> so not only is that spectacular, he slid on the, in under the wire, but Ma Bob's mom, who had come several years later from a totally different source, was not yet eligible to become a citizen. And so she, with our country, was labeled an illegal alien. An illegal. An illegal. An illegal. What did I say? Illegal. Illegal, what no, did I say? You said illegal. Uh, oh, she's, I, an I, alien. she's an alien. Enemy an alien. An enemy alien. alien. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. And because of that, even though Bob's dad was a citizen, they could not have a radio. They could not drive more than 10 miles from their home. They were restricted to where they could live. And so until his mom was able, several years later, before the war ended, but she was put on hold, they had this, this strange situation going where they had, he had technically had the full rights of a citizen, but because his wife did not, he was not able to. Until when? Uh, 1942, three, at least, in there, at least somewhere in there. Yeah, but before the war's end. But uh, we, we do have his certificate of naturalization with the December 8, 1941. It's a great story. Yes? Back to the, the design of the schools, was there any connection between the, the architect for the schools and the evolution of the mail order kit houses and Sears? No, I don't think so. Um, and in fact, one story I sort of like is that very early on in the project, Julius had the idea, well, maybe we could make the schools out of Sears kit houses. Um, and because Sears sold houses in the catalog, you could. Um, and Booker T. Washington kind of gently deflated that idea and said, well, one of the appeals of the program is that it will offer work for people in the communities and, and they will, the schools will be built themselves, will be built by the people in the communities and people will donate. Um, yeah? If, if you want to see a funny uh, Rosenwald School design, Frank Lloyd Wright did a Rosenwald education design, and it was never built. And it will show you exactly why those sort of modernist Bauhaus ideas really were not applicable to the school. Where can we see the Frank Lloyd Wright? Google it. Google it? I love that. I didn't know about that.
Aviva? Anyone else? Oh, a group picture, yes, absolutely, of the Rosenwalds, you Rosenwalds, yes, absolutely, that would be great. Um, anyone else? Jeannie? I can answer. I can answer that. It's confusing. Just like there are two separate Stern families within the Rosenwald family, there are two separate Adler families. Jean will. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the Adlers that Bob talked about. Okay. Let's see now. <laughs> they were. They yeah. were Julius's yeah. sister. Yeah. Julius's married sister an married an Adler. Julius's wife had a sister who married a totally different Adler. No relation, lived in Savannah, that, that Adler family was from Savannah. They're still there, the family of Leopold Adler. Miss Emma is still a, still a mighty force in our town. <laughs> so they are related, but they are related through the wives, not through, they're, they're related through. By marriage. By marriage. So. But how can I say this? That's so right. Emma's husband is related to Peter, but because not because of Julius, but because of Gussie. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> there will be a test. <laughs> I hope you all are taking notes. <laughs> Well, I, I'm interested in those too. What she's talking about is that when um, when Julius met Booker T. Washington, he Washington invited Julius to um, be on the board of Tuskegee, and he said, "Well, if I'm going to consider being on the board, I have to go visit." So, in the fall of 1911, he hired a private railroad car, and he invited family and friends, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Hirsch. Hirsch. Rabbi Hirsch. He took his rabbi from the synagogue. 
and um, his son Lessing and um, various other family members, and they all took, you know, it was a long trip to go from Chicago to Tuskegee. You had to change trains in um, Nashville and then take this little, and you know, even today, how many of you have been to Tuskegee? I mean, even today, it's fairly rural out there. Imagine what it was like 100 years ago. Um, and uh, so they take the train down there. They stayed in Dorothy Hall, which is now the Kellogg Center, the, the uh, conference center where many of us have stayed. And um, they spent three days there. And it was a hugely um, moving experience for Julius and Gussie. I don't know, Peter, do you want to say some more about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, Booker T. Washington and his uh, aide uh, had uh, thoroughly prepared things, and uh, therefore, when uh, Booker T. Washington again asked if Rosemont would serve on the board, the answer was yes. He would come down for frequent board meetings, but one of the things that you did to raise money in those days, and this was not just something that he did, it was something that other trustees did as well, so that you had train cars coming from New York and uh, other eastern cities, but he would always bring a group of, at the appointed time, he would bring a, group, a train car filled with his friends and supporters uh, down to Tuskegee because this was a way you could raise money. So that in 1915, he came with a group that included Jane Addams and her friend, the famous social worker, and uh, another man who was important in his life named Billikoff and others, so a whole group of people who he then later solicited uh, for Tuskegee. This was the way you raised money in those days to help out the school. It was a brilliant way of doing things. And he had gospel songs. Oh yes, gospel songs were very important. That was yes. The right, that was always the closer and that was he discovered that gospel songs in when he first went to Tuskegee. Elizabeth. I, I just wanted to say something that I, I don't think we've talked at all about what being involved with the Rosenwald schools did for Julius Rosenwald. He absolutely loved it. It was the most rewarding thing. He loved gospel music. I've been to Rosenwald schools and heard gospel music there, which is the best place to hear it. And it absolutely gives you chills. So uh, when he was very ill, my father used to constantly take the train from New York to Chicago because they said, hurry, hurry, you've got to see your father. And he often wasn't. He <coughs> suffered in the end. He finally died, as I guess we all do. But he, one day he said, you know, I was very ill. He said, I thought I was going to wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that reminds me of one of my favorite stories about Rosenwald, which was that one time he had to miss a board meeting at Tuskegee because he was going to be traveling in the Middle East. And he sent a telegram to Booker T. Washington to the board saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to miss the board meeting, but I'll be walking in Jerusalem just like John. <laughs> I am not aware of him ever having visited the Texas schools, but I'll let Peter. No, I don't know. Either. Yeah, he visited. He visited the schools around Tuskegee, and he was at a school in North Carolina. Was the four thousandth school built in Method? Wasn't it Method, North Carolina? And he was there for that. But I'm not aware of him ever having been to Texas. It could mean the car of the Rosenwald agent who was visiting the school. Which includes uh, Billy Bond's father. Was Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, anyone else? What happened to the Sears Berlin? <laughs> what happened to Sears?
I, I think that it got, you know, I'm not sure exactly what happened during the Nazi period, but I have a vague feeling that it was uh, taken over, it was handed over to some other entity. I, I don't imagine they would have, uh, what? Sears. The, the oh. Sears in Germany. I don't imagine they Helen would have has, let. Helen has it. Okay, do you have the answer? Well, I, I don't know that I have the answer, but one of the things that Julius did was to, every occasion that the German family had, he would send some Sears shares. And one of the things that the Nazis did was when they took over the Jewish banks, bank accounts and holdings was to take, you know, to freeze the Sears shares too and take them over. Well, in about 1955, when Germany paid restitution to a lot of refugees who left, they gave, they paid, they gave the Sears back, the Sears shares back. And that was something <coughs> my, I know in my part of the family, Ah, if we only had those Sears shares. <laughs> and they, unfortunately, they came back after the family had really gone through very hard times. But ah, those Sears shares really did help in their later years. Wow, that's a good story. Anyone else have a question? Um, I'm asked to remind you of a couple of things. One is that I believe there's an evaluation for the session that uh, oh, is on your chair. It's that white piece of paper. Uh, the organizers would like you to fill that out if you can. Also, immediately after this session, Peter and I will be in the little shop signing our books, if you're interested. Um, and maybe you Rosenwalds will all gather out there and we'll get a picture. Um, and uh, Aviva Kempner's film about Rosenwald um, will be shown tomorrow morning at 8.30, I think. 8.45. 8.45. And again, and again at? One showing at 8.45 tomorrow morning. Um, and it's a wonderful, it, it, it's a wonderful film about Rosenwald. And, and um, so I hope many of you will be able to go. Okay, thank you. Hmm? Only one time. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone.